talk to um, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. I am Marzi Chika Austin, and uh, we are here once again to do justice to a topic uh, that is, of course, having a whole lot of uh, debate. So we want to basically look at um, Now we want to basically look at the topic on oil <laughs> because you know when we talk of oil, basically people who think they own oil when in a true sense of it, they they are not in control of it. You see them shouting oil. <laughs> See them shouting our oil. So that is what we want to discuss. That is exactly what we want to talk about. And I believe I'm coming out loud and clear. Um, I believe both the visual and the videos, the video production is uh, reaching out. Or should I say, doing the needful. So I also urge us to share this program as much as you can. Share it. Uh, we have been for some times. We have been taking it as a responsibility to educate our people, to educate Africans, to educate the larger uh, black race. Very, very important to to understand that. So I would love us to confirm if our video and audio is coming out loud and clear, then we can now move on to talk about um, the politics of oil. Uh, while I'm waiting for that, okay, somebody said uh, the offering the news is saying uh, is loud and clear, and I also want to use this opportunity to urge us to, you know. Um, Follow up that page, we are from I think they have a, a wonderful, you know, wonderful reportage when it comes to the struggle, when it comes to the general picture of what is going on. Uh, the Biafra News is a very good, is a, a, one of the commendable platforms that uh, they try to push sincere and objective information. So we are talking about the politics of oil, we are talking about how much oil does Nigeria, Nigeria have. Because, you know, when we talk about some of these things, people do not understand the, the energy politics, the politics of energy, the politics of uh, natural resources. Most people don't understand it. Us, most of us don't, do not see it for what it is. And I also urge us to share this program. Very, very important. So, um, we are basically talking about the oil, the energy politics. You know, this is one of the, oil is supposed to be a blessing. I mean, the natural deposit is supposed to be a blessing. But it has turned to be a curse, you know, it has turned to be a kind of an impediment. Not just to the indigenous owners, but by extension to everyone that finds him or herself within the political space or geographical expression known as the Nigerian state. Or you have posed it. A, a, you know, or you have turned to be a curse. You know, it has been so detrimental to the development of human development. You know, 
uh, structural development, uh, mental development, any kind of development, they all you have pose a severe threat to human enhancement in Nigeria. And I'm going to explain something to us because most of us do not understand that over 98% of global conflict, over 98% of global conflict, it doesn't matter where it's being fought, it doesn't matter where those conflicts are being experienced, whether in Ukraine-Russian conflict, whether in um, Iraq-Iran conflict, whether South Sudan and uh, Sudanese conflict, whether South Korea or North Korea, whether Biafran Nigerian conflict, the bottom line of those conflicts is energy contention, the quest to control the resources beneath the earth. That has been the problem. I can tell you that there is no current crisis happening in any part of the world that is not being propelled by certain powers trying to control the resources. If you look at the crisis between in Congo, you know, the Congo crisis is basically energy, lithium, you know, because Congo produces uh, a lot of uh, lithium which is used in doing, uh, but, you know, uh, this, uh, what is it for? Electric cars and all this, electric car batteries and all this. And the crisis you're seeing in Congo is because certain authorities, certain powers, when I mean certain powers, I'm not even talking about powers within the African continent. I'm talking about powers across African continents trying to decide what happens. If you also look at the African crisis or where we are today, the challenges, the conspiracies, the collaboration, aim at undermining this noble cause. If you remove energy from it, there is no need for this crisis. Those who are containing, doing everything to undermine the project are basically doing that because they felt that, that there is a certain energy that must be controlled in their family. And they do everything possible to undermine human development. Because any day you are mentally developed, you will reject them. And when we talk about development here, we are talking about awareness. What you are seeing in Sahel is because people are being aware. People, awareness, consciousness is being raised. The flag for consciousness is high. Ordinarily, most places, if you want to check for low human capital index, go and look places you have oil, you have natural deposit. That is where you see worst backwardness, worst under education. Go to Niger Delta for instance. You will see what is going on in Niger Delta. I'm just giving you an instance. Even when they say they are educated, what, what is the quality of education they were supposed to? Of course, is, is education of Tawdry, Tautism, and all manners of, you know, constituting internal conflict amongst themselves. Nobody exposes anybody to history. The ideal political consciousness is being eroded because the best way to advance that exploitation is to subjugate them into mental delusion. That is just what it is. 
And if, you, if there's anything that these guys we are talking about, if there's anything that you know may, makes them feel uncomfortable, is the level of your awareness, how informed you are, matters a lot to them. That's why they do everything to make sure that even when you think you are going to uh, universities to acquire knowledge, they make sure you go there and become more stupid. They create a structure that your university, instead of your university impacting you positively, your university should mold you to be more stupid and idiotic. And you can use Nigeria as a replicant example. Check everyone. When people say, don't challenge me, I'm educated, you understand their own version of education. Not education that is being molded towards rationalism, being rational, being logical. Rather, it's an education where people believe that when you are fluent in English, then probably you can go and open a POS business. At worst, then if you're a lady, then you might start up online hookup. So you now understand that people go to school to acquire a kind of decent way of presenting their ideas. And don't think it's a coincidental structure. No, it never happened that, that way. It's not coincidental. It was systematically structured that way so that you don't in any way get sense. As to challenge these entities we are talking about. So they, 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 make, they design a structure in a sense, in a sense that if you enroll into school, you are just going there to know how to speak. So that for the ladies, you can start coming online, doing TikTok, going naked or half naked, you know, flopping your breast here and there. Going almost naked, showing your, you know, the shape of your ass and the rest of it. Thereby making you to be busy in stupidity. Channeling your mind. In fact, Africa is in a very big problem. We've not really gone through the deepest issue. You see, Africa is a very, in a very big mess. The only thing that can save Africa is the revolution that is happening in Sahel, if it's been sustained. If not, especially when I talk of Africa, I'm talking about sub saharan Africa. It's in a very big mess. Because there is a very soft, destructive agenda that is going on. Most people do not know. And what is this agenda? They are gradually packaging a certain generation they are packaging a certain generation trying to make you think that the best thing you can pursue the best career you can pursue now is a content creation it is it is a systematic thing and make no mistake i always say it i've said it some time ago if you think that the person who run slave trade for over a century will just dump it and allow you be you are stupid if you take somebody who organized a trade system where your ancestors your progenitors were you know shipped down to the new world he came up and told you he has abolished slave trade and you're jumping up thinking it's really abolished you are not smart what he did was to decommission a system of servitude and introduce a new one that is alien to you. It's as simple as that. But the centrality of it is that exploitation is still going on. The difference is this. You're not being shipped down to the new world. Nobody is taking you to the new world any longer. 
nobody is taking you through the uh, point of no return in, uh, you know, in Benin Republic or in Ghana. Nobody is invading the Hitler lands, taking people on chain or in chain, as the case may be, because methodology has changed, method of servitude has changed, but. For you to think that they have stopped subjugating you into servitude, that means you're stupid. You're irrational. It's just synthetic. Sorry, it's your synthesis. Diction, language, vari uh, variation. When they ended transatlantic slave trade, a lot of Africans were jumping on. Yes, kudos to the abolitionist, African abolitionist, who fought against it. But where they got it wrong was this. Those African abolitionists were celebrating that transatlantic slave trade have stopped. They didn't know that the slave masters only ended a system of servitude known to the Africans and introduced colonialism which was still another version of servitude. And when, Af when Africans realized that colonialism was also another version of servitude, they started protesting, started agitating. We don't want it. We don't want it. And they said, okay, you don't want colonialism. You want decolonization. You want us to decolonize. You want us to leave. They left gave you a flag independence just the way they gave nigeria and in 1960 and the before 1960 a lot of african countries were also jumping up hey we have gotten independence and they were laughing at you because they knew you were talking about decolonization why they are now introducing another system of servitude known as imperialism colonialism was direct control. You saw them in your soil, taking everything, controlling everything. Imperialism, they are no longer in your soil. They are in Britain Wood institutions, World Bank, IMF. They are in Oval Office. They are in Number 10 Down Street. They are in Brussels and the other areas. Deciding who becomes a president in your soil. Because through the instrument of imperialism, they have trained a whole lot of idiots, supported them, positioned them, and made it in a way that when you say you don't want this one, they give you another alternative that is also as bad as that. It's just a question of you can't make sure. They will always pre pre present, they will always flood every channel of your choice making. If you go to you say APC is corrupt, they have also positioned people in PDP. If you say PDP is correct, uh, corrupt, they have also positioned people in other parties. Just to make sure you do not enjoy indigenous control system. And people are not jumping up, it tend as it, it it looks as if people are not beginning to understand imperialism. And they have introduced another system of the, the most destructive one that's going to be in Africa. And what is that? All these nonsense that are going on, known as content creation. Because they are programming your mind to focus on illusion, chasing clouds. Why secretly funding some of these guys, you know? And you believe that just be a content creator, you blow. You are no longer conscious of who is taking what in your soil, who is planting what you're eating, who is controlling the drugs you're taking. Because they have created a system where you cannot criticize them. For instance, this platform is already a dead platform. It can never be monetized because we have offended the rules. Who have violated the rules several and so it's a dead platform. 
they made it in a way that because you're chasing maybe ten thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars you don't go to areas that will open the eyes of the people so you come on this platform because you don't want to violate the rules you tell all your language you modify yourself you don't discuss anything that will challenge their level of control rather you come on your platform to make people more stupid than you then they will tell you at the end of the month you have certain amount of money in the name of monetized money and while you're chasing you know black people are very terrible while you're chasing maybe fifty thousand dollars somebody is busy lifting the cubics of gas in your backyard taking them to you these are the real money because the gas is going to say he's going to save billions of us dollars while you're celebrating ten thousand twenty thousand dollars probably be the bungalow and you make a whole lot of noise about it and they look at you and laugh because they know how stupid you are they cannot encourage their own offsprings. Europeans cannot encourage their own offsprings to chase the clout we are chasing online in the name of content. They encourage them to have a, an ideal information and chase the real world. The real world is in the soil. But they are programming your mind not to be interested in what is in your soil. They are programming your mind not to be interested in who is planting what in your backyard. How many of these so-called uh, social media influencers talk about GMO? Genetically modified foods. How many of them talk? They don't know anything about it. How many of them talk about control? The indigenous people only owing a control of their resources. None of them. Because they cannot you see, black man is terrible. We are, we are so terrible that when we got to a social level, if we got to a level in the society, we are comfortable. We don't care what others are passing through. And it's a very heartbreaking thing. So, what are we trying to say? Well, that should be a kind of uh, preliminary uh, discussion but what are we trying to say um, we want to look about the Nigerian state and her resources it is really terrible if you listen to the likes of uh, Mustafa who was the chief, uh, chief CSO to late General Sani Abacha you understand that if there is anything anyone desires is to see Nigeria disintegrate. If you also listen to the lies of Dangote of recent, I, I don't actually have much pity with Dangote because Dangote was also an agent of the imperialists in Africa and in Nigeria. Dangote was used terribly to destroy a lot of microeconomic uh, enterprises. He never allowed competition, market competition. He strangled other emerging competitors into debt and knocked them off market. So such a person, if he's crying today, I don't own him any pity because his antecedent was intended with what those who are dealing with him, using to deal with others, or should I say, dealt with others. So, what are we trying to say? You see, most of you don't understand. I was talking to some persons two days ago, and uh, they were saying, that uh, Nigeria is so rich. That is an average, that is the worst deception anybody can ever have in the back of his mind. That Nigeria is so rich, blessed with oil, gas, mineral resources, excuse me, and others. 
And I told the person that Nigeria doesn't own any oil. I told them anyway, they were a group of persons, I told them that Nigeria had no oil. Hmm. You could see the way they looked at me. Like someone who is coming from another planet, who never knew anything, who was absolutely naive. That was how they looked at me. And I said to them, listen, if I have a car, for instance, and I approach a financial institution, probably a bank, and say to a bank, give me a loan of $10, and I have a car that is valued or measurable to that amount, so that in case I default in payment, you should lay hold on that car to recover the loan. What most people call collateral. Now, in a true sense of it, do you think that car belongs to me? It doesn't. Because any default, I lose that car. Even as a matter of fact, how I use that car is very, very important. Because if I'm using that car and that car is depreciating, and it gets to a point that I cannot service the loan any longer, the value of the car will be revalued. And I, it will not be that I am even owing. If the car value as of two years ago when I approached the financial institution for loan, if the car value was $9, for instance, and I was using that car and devalue it or depreciated it to 6 don't you think I have another $3 to make up? That was exactly what happened in the case of Nigeria. That was exactly what happened in the case of Nigeria. But nothing has ever happened so bad than the Buhari regime. Buhari regime outrightly sold Nigeria to a point that it will be extremely difficult for Nigeria to recover. You see, why we spend our time to tell you all these things is for you to understand the society you find yourself in. Because if you are not informed, you start being stupid arguing helplessly and grandlessly, thinking you, you have something to offer, not knowing that you're just defending an indefensible cause. So what are we trying to say? Nigeria is, an, is a country that is blessed when it comes to oil, when it comes to other solid minerals like gold, uh, partly uranium, California, and a whole lot of them. That is Nigeria for you. But do you know why Nigeria is deeply impoverished? I'm going to explain to you. Nigeria is impoverished because Nigeria is not an organic state. Nigeria is never an organic state. How do I mean by organic? You see, Many years ago, Mazen Namdekano intelligently and excellently taught us on all this. He quite educated us on all this. Nigeria was originally built for internal contention and conflict. I'm going to explain to you what Britain did. And that's why when we tell people Nigeria is irredeemable, people will not understand. Britain in 1914 understood the importance of creating artificial conflict in Nigeria. Because the only way the imperialists thrive is to instigate divide and rule. Where there is no internal conflict, the imperialists cannot thrive. 
that is what it is everywhere. That's why where there is none, they do everything to create one. Because they understand immediately people are having internal contention. It's a, a huge opportunity for them to loot while the people are busy fighting themselves. So what the British did in the case of Nigeria, they understood that the North and the South have no compatibility. They know it. That the Southern Nigeria and the Northern Nigeria have no compatibility. Ordinarily, they would have said to the Northern Nigeria, remain on your own because you are a food war, you run a food war system. You have a highly centralized system. In the South, you have decentralized system and of course advanced capitalist system so comparatively speaking there is no similarity but the British gov colonial government knew that if they had allowed the North to have similar ideology to go on their own there is a possibility for them to develop on the line of their own ideology And if they had allowed South to go their own, there is a way, there is a possibility for the South to develop on their own line of ideology. Now, what they now did is this: if we allow people that have similarity in ideology to move on their own, there are every possibility that there won't be conflict, internal conflict. So, what are we going to do? Let us bring this highly divided in terms of ideology, deeply separated in terms of religion, and of course, divergent when it comes to political opinion. Let us bring them together and create an inevitable conflict, because these are two different ideologies. By the time we move them together, they, were, they are going to be quarreling until the world ends. And because they are quarreling, we will have opportunity to steal anything we want to steal because they will be focused, fighting themselves. That is the political chemistry behind the formation of Nigeria. That's why Britain said they did not amalgamate the North and Southern Puritans for the benefit of the indigenous people. No. They did that for the benefit of the British government. So you can imagine a political structure that was put on since 1914. Till today, the people are dying, killing themselves, destroying themselves, busy fighting themselves. Why the British government is busy? stealing and stealing and stealing as much as they want because the indigenous people are distracted with ethnic fights confronting themselves seeking for a way to be one where there is no thing like that existing <laughs> that's why nigeria is the only country that since 1914 have been preaching for unity and peace. Till now they have not found anyone. Go and research, but I'm very far. Nigeria is the only country that every year she preaches for unity and she has never found one. Till the moment. She has never found one. Over 100 years, if I'm not mistaken, a country have inconcated, embedded the slogan let's live in unity since over 100 years and she has never found one and she can never find it because the ideological you know this orientation or should I say that is much you can, there's nothing you can do about it you cannot there's something you can do about it. 
You see, when people try to be highly hypocritical, the, one of the problems I have with the Nigerian people is this. They only become responsible when they are almost at the point of dying. I don't know. Their brains don't function when they are young. When they are their vibrant age, you see them contributing nuisance. No meaningful contribution. But wait them immediately their the, the life allows them to approach 80. 80 something. You start seeing them talking responsibly. You begin to wonder, are they not these persons who were aiding and abetting criminalities and the destructions? What is wrong? What has come over him? He is not speaking like a saint. So that is what it is. So the British people, in fact, it's not just a case of Britain. I know I'm emphasizing more on Britain because the British government happens to be the colonial power. But ordinarily, the, the imperialist powers knew that in as much as Nigeria remains one, it is for their own benefit. Because the people will be fighting themselves. You can ask see it's happening. It's just happening. Tunubu is there, the North is now fighting him. Do you think Tunubu that is preoccupied with the mindset of how do I preserve my government? Because his government is facing a severe threat. Do you think Tunubu that is preoccupied with how do my government finish the term? Do you think that the same Tunubu will be more focused to know who is taking the solid minerals in the North? Do you think he will be interested to know who, what is going on in East in terms of exploit, uh, you know, uh, explorations and all the rest of them? He will not because he's already distracted. And Britain consciously structured the society that way so that there is no time the people will be focused. There is no time the people will be free from war and start building. That is what Nigeria, that is how Nigeria is designed. So you now understand how these guys operate. You now understand how they design the whole thing. In fact, the they went from national level and transcended to the communal levels. Let me tell you, places like um, Ogoni or Haji Ebema, you know, even in Jorland, are all, you know, fitted with one crisis or the other courses of the, uh, the imperialist multinational companies operating in those areas even when there is nothing like conflict they instigate one of course we have uh, enablers local enablers they will recruit some youth or even community leaders Arm these people, arm these people, encourage them to keep on fighting their various fashions while they keep on operating. And they became so intelligent that now why these people are fighting themselves, they now mobilize the Nigerian army to help them and chase the two of them out of the community to enable them to do their stuff. That's exactly what is done. So, these guys have gone to the point of outrightly purchasing Nigeria. Most of you do not know. Buhari was the worst thing that ever happened to Nigeria. And uh, Tunubu is also part of the mess because he never criticized Buhari while Buhari was doing all those things. Never mind the present languages that uh, the, the, the suffering of Nigerians is now from us. 
anyway, it was past administrations. Those things are all hypocritical statements. Because you were observing, you were watching, you were close, you were you know, a stakeholder in APC, watching all these things that were happening. And today you want the people to start. So if the, the people, if the people you're pointing at defrauded or mismanaged public funds, why not put up a, an investigatory panel? It's simple. But they are all the same. They are just hypocritical. They are just agents of the imperialists. So what may happen was, during Buhari time, most of you never knew. Buhari mortgage. Buhari was busy collecting loans here and here. And Buhari's regime was so terrible because it was so terrible in the sense that Buhari was not even knowing what those loans were done with. He never knew. He was just busy signing, 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 signing. Why his A were busy wasting or even looting the loans. They were not utilizing it. Loans are not bad all over the world. Countries borrow. America is the one of the most indebted countries on earth. In fact, what America is owing China is alarming. It runs into trillions of US dollars. But loans are meant to the, you know, are meant to be channeled towards developmental projects that will in turn bring in money for the society. But why Nigeria loan seeking process is terrible is this. Nigeria borrows money for consumption. Nigerian leaders approach financial institutions or Britain Wood institutions and said, give us money, we want to use the money and buy private. Does it make sense? Loaning for consumption. You don't, you don't loan for consumption. You loan for production. Because what you produce, you have the ability to service the loan. I will tell you one terrible thing Buari did. During Buari time, Buari approached China and said to China, because why you are when you are seeking for loan, you have to bring proposal, the project proposal. What are you going to do with this loan? Let us see it on paper, black and blue. Guari went and told the Chinese that he wants a loan in order to build rail lines. And Amechi happens to be the minister for transport then. And China saw it because when they came, the in the diagram, in the in the proposal they presented to the Chinese uh, creditors, they linked up a lot of rail line on the eastern region, and the Chinese saw it, and we are so interested in it. Do you know why the Chinese were so interested in it? The Chinese knew that if the money that we are going to loan Nigeria is to be used on this thing they present to us, we will definitely recover the loan. Why? Because the Chinese knew, the Chinese said to themselves, if these guys invest this loan on Eastern Rail Lines, that the Easterners have a high velocity of traveling, they travel a lot. They have a high mobility. They travel a lot. They do a whole lot of logistics, which means the rail or the trains will easily be generating a whole lot of revenue because the Igbo people travel a lot. And that was what Buari presented to them. Give us this money. We want to build rail lines in the East. And China saw it as, as an investment opportunity. Do you know what? Immediately Buari grabbed the money. He cancelled the Eastern Line and took the loan to start building rail line in the north. Funny enough, 
he even went as far as trying to build from Nigeria to Niger. If, you, if I'm lying, you can ask Chibike Amechi, who happens to be the Minister for Transport, as at this time we are talking about. It's barely a few years now, not even up to a decade we are talking about. Buhari cancelled it and channeled it to the north. Look at the terrible thing that happened. Every loan has a moratorium period. It has a period of grace. It has a period of servicing it. Now, when Buari developed the northern lines and the trains were put into service, do you know what happened? The Nigerian government could not generate the desired amount of revenue from those lines because it was simple. It was simple. The north, a northerner will prefer to climb on the back of trailer for 500 from east to, to Abuja or even Kano than to pay the amount for train or pay 5,000 from Abuja to Kano on train. An average northerner, that is what I'm saying. So when federal government realized that it was so difficult for them to generate the desired driving, and the Chinese were also knocking at their door, do you know what they did? They started subsidizing the rates, the, the transport fare. What it means is that if you are to pay 3000 from Abuja to Kano, federal government will tell you, pay 1000 the federal government will pay 2000 for you towards transport subsid subsidizing. They began to subsidize because they want to see a way to recoup the investment money. And before you know, terrorists blew up everything. People abandoned it. And today, uh, only God knows what is happening in that investment. And the debt is there staring at us. So, it got to a point that no country or no creditor could credit Nigeria. I'm talking about Buhari's era. Buhari so much borrowed for consumption. He borrowed and he gives members of the house the West money, the ministers will loot because Buhari is not that informed educationally. He doesn't understand economies. He doesn't understand anything. Absolutely nothing. So those guys who are just running things around your busy, they must seem well. So it got to a time that no creditor could credit Nigeria. Do you know what Buhari government did? Buhari government decided to sell away the oil in Biafra land to these creditors. It is allegedly that he sold it about 30 billion US dollars. He decided to use it as a collector. And these creditors were happy to own those oil wells. You know when people say our oil, you are you are naive. There's nothing like our oil. Your that nonsense you're talking about, your oil, is owned by Mwabeke. Because it's a it's a kind of collateral. It's already more mortgaged. Because you are shouting your oil and uh, for, unfortunately you even call yourself a graduate. But you don't even know that the oil in your backyard belongs to one. James June in UK, he owns it, or should I say, belongs to what and and Ruven in US, and you're busy making noise. So, what Wally did, Wally now felt that after I really have been, you know putting up pressures here and there 
at a time, most of you never knew, at a time in this struggle, Buhari was considering that the five states in the East can go. Most of you never knew. And for Buhari, the best way to punish the Biafran people is to use our resources as a collateral for loans that Nigeria was collecting. It was at a time Buhari resolved with him that the headache was so much. Let these people just go. Let them go. And he made a, a funny statement. They are, they are a dot in a set. He was even jokingly saying they were pushing up the narrative that we don't have access to waterways. And in order to further punish us, he took our resources as a collateral. And most of you never knew. Some of these loans are 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Which means the creditors are going to control this oil well for this time period. Except Nigeria disintegrates. And that is where international law laws come in on how to share both assets and liabilities. So, hope you understand what I'm saying. Now, some of these deals we have done on, on absolute secret levels. Some of these things we have done, even members of the seniors, most of them we are not aware. Some in the executive circle, we are not aware. <laughs> they never knew. The Nigeria does not even have any oil again. The oil Nigeria is bragging. Or one zombie comes out and starts shouting our oil. He doesn't even know he doesn't own any oil. Because Bwari did all this secretly. And because Bwari did it and smartly knew that these people have already taken the Nigerian resources. Buhari now initiated the process and said that any MPC should go public, he should go limited. They move from any MPC as a public corporation to any MPC as a public interest or public limited. Most of you never knew. He now moved from an EMPC of public corporation, which the share is absolutely owned by Nigeria. He now moved it to an enterprise, or should I say, a limited liability. Which means, because anytime you hear limited liability, it is individuals driven, it's not a government stuff. Government can have a share. But government is not meant to run everything about the company. Anything you hear limited liability. So Buhari have knew that he has successfully sold away everything. In fact, every crude oil that is coming out of Nigeria is not owned by Nigeria. It's not owned by Nigeria. And he did this secretly. That's why when we see some northern people protesting, why will you protest? What you're suffering today is being done by your brother, your kissman. It's not a Tunubu's problem. Though Tunubu must have known all these things, but decided to keep quiet. It was not then there. But to be honest, the, the suffering everybody is complaining is more of worry doings than to know. So, Buhari did all these things secretly and turned an MPC to limited liability. 
and the, when the likes of Dangote, funny enough, was busy investing in oil sector, they were laughing at him. They were laughing at him because they knew if he knew that Nigeria crude oil is not owned by Nigeria, he cannot invest such a money. And do you know what? Because they were doing this thing like as a kind of, you know, court thing. Nobody, don't say it. Oh, we don't want Nigerians to know. Let, let if it tell Nigerians that the crude oil does not even belong to them. It belongs to somebody in India. It belongs to somebody in China. It belongs to somebody in Europe. The Nigerians might, might, might sit everywhere ablaze. The Niger data will be boiling. They say, let us make it a secret thing. For how long can secret last? Now, Dangote finished building his refinery. <clears throat> In fact, as a matter of fact, when he was building the refinery, they never told him that the crude oil he's eyeing to source locally does not belong to Nigeria. They never told him. And they allowed him to be sourcing money, sourcing loans here and there to, you know, put up something, of course, for the betterment of the Nigerian people. Now, the young man, or should I say, it's not wrong to call him a young man because he's an elderly person. So, the man finished building the refinery. Okay, an MPC supply us crude oil. Do you know what an MPC told him? They technically told him that they are not in control of the oil. Look at what an MPC told him. He said, crude supply to refineries. You can read it. Follows willing buyer, willing seller principle. <laughs> this is what an MPC told Dangote. That the crude oil you think you want to buy, you might have your money, you might be willing to buy. But the people that own it, because it's no longer in Nigerian property, that the people that own it might not be interested to even sell to you. And that is how Dangote realized he was in a mess. And that is, you know, the war you're seeing happening between Dangote and the NMPC and the Nigerian government, that is the foundation of it. In fact, he said, his friends told him not to invest. Probably those of his friends had this classified information, but they never shared to him. Because Dangote felt he was building a refinery in a crude oil producing nation, or should I say country. Little did he know that the crude oil he thought belongs to Nigeria is no longer in Nigerian property. We already sold everything in you. And when he wanted to make noise, they told him, an MPC, this in Nigeria, supposedly government, a company that Nigerian government have the major share, or Nigerian government is the major shareholder, is not telling her citizens that have invested that it's better you go to other place and buy. Because people <coughs> who own us might decide not to sell to you. Ordinarily, this thing would have been a trending issue. Bloggers would have been carrying it. Your blog, uh, uh, social media influencers would have been analyzing extensively. But because you have been structured to be stupid, they have programmed you to chase nakedness on social media flop all your breast in the name of chasing followers and not minding the critical topic that is definitely going to affect your generation on board. The time we turn, you will realize that you have gotten this so-called uh, monetized money, but your safety, your life is not assured. Because you're deceiving yourself, you serve this de de uh, you know, delusion. Because 
That is what we think. So, NMPC informed Dangote emphatically, unambiguously, that you might have your money means you're a willing buyer. But to those who own this crude oil, not we are not talking about the Niger Delta owners, so because nothing they don't own anything. Everything they think they own is already sold off. Now they are not telling Dangote you might be a willing buyer. But those who own it, not the Nigerian government, are not willing to sell to you. Let me not tell you why they are not willing to sell to Dangote. I'm talking about this imperialist realm. But everything. Why are they not willing to sell to Dangote? They know that if Dangote is to buy crude oil, he's going to buy it in Naira. And these guys don't believe in Naira. They don't believe in the future of Naira. They are just like these aircraft operators, international aircraft operators. Do you know the problem they had with Nigerian government? They were telling their passengers, Nigerian passengers, to book their flight in dollars. It's because you don't have a country. You don't have a country. I believe some of you are watching from Dubai or even India or even uh, um, China and other people. Have you ever wanted to travel from India to Nigeria and you fail not to pay? in rubies in their money or the company the uh, aircraft company want to book their flight to nigeria start, start mandating you to gant buy dollar first it's, it's needless you can't do it if you do it in india they shut you down i'm talking about asian country i don't want to mention us and europe or canada because most of you know these are classic societies I'm talking about even UAE Dubai. Are you telling me if you want to leave Dubai, you cannot book international flight with your Dubai local currency? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. So, but because this guy, but this guy's mandated Nigerian flyers. That if they are, if they want to book international flight, they should first of all go and buy dollar, because they don't believe in your country. That is sinking you. They don't believe. They don't have confidence in your future. They believe that you are not even what calling a country. How much more a nation? So the problem Dangote have is that Dangote, Dangote is to buy crude oil from these foreign owners of this crude oil he will definitely buy with naira and those guys are saying no we are not going to sell to you in naira as a matter of fact if you want to buy it from us go get dollars which means dangote has to first of all approach cbn And you know what dollar is in, in, in Nigeria? You might buy one naira today. You say let you let you go to the bathroom and we only for you to come out. They say it's three naira. It's so unstable. It's so messing up business that nobody could, you know, know the best way to manage it. And they said to Dangote. You cannot pay us in Naira. We don't have confidence in your Naira. We don't have confidence in it. Go look for dollar. Because you think we are local owners. We are not local people. Pay us in dollar so that it will be easy for us to get the money out of the economy. Capital flight. Let us repatriate our money to our home country. Because here is just a market, an outlet. Where we come from, page, make money and get out. And Dangote began to <clears throat> raise voices. You know. In fact, when Dangote started, uh, when he intended building the the refinery, he said according from Saudi Arabia. For those of you who had 
who had uh, his uh, his uh, what's it called? Yeah. You know, for those of you who had his uh, interview. They now told him, they said to Dangote, from Saudi Arabia, don't build that. Don't build that refinery. In fact, let me show you something. I just projected something. Say, said, $20 billion Dangote refinery will disrupt Europe's oil and the gas industry. I told you, because these guys know that if that if they are going to sell to Dangote and Dangote start refining, the price of oil will fall. And Nigerian importers, those who are importing this oil from Europe, will have no business opportunity to exploit. What they did is that they told their friends, you see, most of, most of you, I, the people I pity so much are some of these security agencies. Because if they know what they are defending, if they know what they are doing to their children on poor, they will never in any way defend Nigeria. Do you know Nigeria is the only country on planet Earth that they are, have leaders, the politicians in Nigeria are willing to collaborate with foreign agents to destroy the lives of their citizens. That's what happened. I can point several life-changing projects that Nigerian politicians collaborated with foreign agents to destroy or disrupt. What of a Jokuta steel industry? If Nigeria have a viable steel industry today, Nigeria army has no business going to going to beg Iran or Turkey to sell them bullets. Do you know that Zimbabwe? Zimbabwe is under Western sanction. But Zimbabwe today have perfected, Russia have helped them to build a good steel industry. Zimbabwe now is producing bullets. Do you think Zimbabwe army, the money they are spending going elsewhere to buy bullets, do you think they are going to spend it again? They are going to, you know, reallocate it in other se uh, sector of the military. But Nigerian leaders are experts in wrecking havoc. They will collaborate with foreigners and destroy lives. And that's what they are doing. And the most annoying part of it is that the people whom they are destroying their lives will open their useless mouth and call your excellence. Do you know what an excellent? If you want to call excellent people, you look at men of integrity and, uh, you know, pedigree. And you can see, these guys are collaborating with their foreigners to make sure that Dangote refinery, that Dangote regretted ever building that refinery. And let me tell you for your information, if you think Dangote will win, that Dangote will have his way, you're joking. They are already out. They are already out to make sure they made him to regret ever building, making that investment. They don't care how many jobs that are going to be lost. They don't, they don't give a damn. That is how destructive Nigerian leaders are. They don't care. They have technically told him, you can be a willing buyer, but there is no willing seller. Hey, oh goodness me. And somebody calls it government, calls it a country. It's not. It is absolutely not. So what are we trying to say? We are telling you all these things for you to understand because there are so many of you who want to be politically correct. You are being politically correct at the detriment of the future of your generation, both born and unborn. So many countries are wishing to have refinery. The one Nigeria have, the government, the same leaders of Nigeria, we are the ones that sabotage it. 
Nigeria has a refinery in Kaduna. Nigeria has a refinery in Wari. Nigeria has Oni in River State and other places. But it was Nigerian leaders who took money from foreign imperialists and destroyed these refineries. Nigerian leaders. It is still Nigerian leaders that are collaborating with foreigners to sabotage the, one of the biggest private-owned refineries in Nigeria. They are also working to make sure it doesn't work. Now, these people tomorrow will tell you to be patriotic. I don't understand if they understand the definition of patriotism. They will come and tell you, do a speak well about Nigeria. Why they are doing your own is that you are even speaking bad if there is anything like that about Nigeria. But their own is that they are doing wickedness against the country development. That is what it is. That's exactly what it is. So when we are saying this. When the likes of Mazen and the Kanu came up and we are saying this, most of you do not understand because you are genetically packed not to understand anything. Because they have, they have so much encircled you to a point that when you go to school, you confront people they have backroad to teach you how to be stupid. If you come out of that school and go to church or mosque, they have also bankrupt people to teach you more idiotic things. Let me go to the streets. That is where you will finish. Bata, bata. Because they have created a system that will make you to be destroyed. That will make you not to understand anything. That will make you to be chasing what is not worth chasing for. Yes. Yes. They have designed a disadvantageous system for you. And you're jumping up. If you take a sample, uh, sample or if you take a questionnaire amongst Nigerian youth, what, what is preoccupying them is social media noise making and content creation. That is. That is what you see flooding online. No consciousness. Look at Burkina Faso. Look at what is going on. Their youths are busy transforming everywhere. It's also happening in Mali. And these ones are talking about irresponsible things. So we must understand all these things. We must understand that Nigeria owns no resources. She owns no resources. And there's nothing you can do about it. The only thing that can salvage the whole situation is get the country disintegrated. Although, let's see what is going on in respect to the proposed uh, importation of a referendum in the Nigerian constitution has been you know uh, you know has been suggested by Emeka and Yoko and by the rest of them. The who, who are going to be one of the non diplomats. So that is what we are saying. Let us understand what is going on because it is our own good. So from here I want to thank you so much for joining us to be coming, especially weekends, to be discussing. So stay safe, 